it would be it would be very simple things. It wouldn't be like write an S function that solves the right hand side of the equations for this bioreactor or anything like that. It'd be like how would you find the um, transfer function if I if you have from this state space model in MATLAB. Then you'd go into the notes and you'd say, oh, there's something called SS2TF. How do I use that? So I mean, there'll be nothing that's not in the notes. And it'll be like a command or two at most. I haven't made the exam, so I don't know. But the last time someone got angry at me because I said there wouldn't be, and then I did, right? And then they, they got they sent me a, an email. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you know, something like that would be possible, although it's certainly not the focus, you know. All right. Um, yeah, so exams in class. It's open book and open note, meaning you can bring uh, your notes, lecture notes, you can bring the textbook, and um, you can bring your ho solved homework assignments. Okay. Um, don't bring a catalog of all the solved homework problems for the last 12 years or something like that. Not that not that the problem is going to be any, it's not going to be an old problem anyway, but just so everyone has the same thing. Um, it should, I promise you, a shorter exam. We'll see if I can execute, okay, than I normally give. So we'll have two lectures, this lecture, lecture on Tuesday, uh, Thursday, and then Friday will be a review session. I'll go over the exam from last fall, okay. And it's already posted up there, the exam and the solution both. All right, so I think that's it. So I need to finish this lecture. Maybe I can get caught up. So we were talking about instrumentation. I think I preface this by saying this is best to learn in the laboratory, but we're at least introducing the basic concepts. So I already did the introduction. I essentially finished the second part, which is basically about sensors. The only thing I didn't do was I didn't talk about um, this here. Okay. So this just depicts, for example, um, a, the behavior of a flow meter. So the goal is to measure flow, okay, and what's being depicted. So this is some units, you know, liters per hour, or whatever. And then this is uh, the number of times that particular measurement occurs. This is just for illustration purposes. Obviously, you have a flow meter it provides a measurement very, very frequently. <laughs> but so the idea here is that here's the true value of the flow. Okay, you don't know that. You understand because you only know what the flow is from the measurement. And so if you measure, so this is the number of occurrences, so you got this number, what, 0 0.351 times this, four, four times, so on and so forth, okay? So you can see from this there's an issue of um, random error here, okay? So in other words, because there's noise in the flow and the instrument, you know, you might measure this one time and this one time and this one time, but you know, if it's a good, if it's a good device, there's, a, there's some kind of um, B here. <coughs> now he's there. All right. Um, this is uh, just random error, okay? And if this random error is small, it's just something you have to deal with and it should, should be okay. If the randomness is huge, um, then you've got a major problem. So here, this is the, what they say here is the most likely value. And then this distance here, or this amount here, is the, is the bias, okay? This is usually a major problem and it's a problem because obviously the measurement you're getting is really quite far off, almost double the actual value or two-thirds greater. And you don't know this is actually true because you don't know this. You don't know the true flow. Okay? So for example, if you were metering ingredients into a reactor um, and you thought you were metering in this amount and you were actually metering in this amount, that could be a problem. When we do control, the controller will eventually compensate for these kind of errors. Um, but it's still not very desirable to have these kind of problems in your instrumentation. So. Um, Depending on the type of device you have, you can expect this bias will be small. Like if it's a thermocouple, you'd like to think it's small. But if it's a composition measurement, it might be quite high. And the same thing with the variability. If you, certain type of measurements, like composition, will have high variability. Yeah? Um, how does the controller like, set itself for this error if you don't know if it's going to be like double or like half? Right. So I'm supposed to repeat the question. I was told to repeat the question. The question is, how does the controller compensate for this unknown error? So the idea is because we use this, the power feedback control. So let's say you wanted to control the temperature of this reactor, and you're doing it by metering in a catalyst or something like this into the reactor. So even though there's an error in the actual flow measurement, eventually the controller will figure out what flow it needs to establish in order to get the correct temperature coming out. 
So it'll figure out that, you know, it should meter in what it thinks is this amount, even though the actual amount is this, beca because um, the controller doesn't, all it needs to do is it'll take adjustments until the temperature coming out of the reactor is what you want it to be, okay? So if you're, if you're operating the, c the plant in what you might call open loop, which means you're operating it manually, eventually, you know, you might have a recipe, I don't know, so every process, think, let's say a polymer has a recipe, add all these ingredients, catalyst, solvent, co-catalyst, monomers, and you get the polymer you want, and you might be told that um, you should have this flow rate of the catalyst, but you run the plant and you realize if you run this flow of catalyst, you don't get enough reaction, because the actual flow is down here. <laughs> so eventually you would also figure it out by trial and error. But the controller will be able to figure it out automatically. I think we talk more about control, you'll see that. Okay, so now on to um, control valves. So if you have a control system operating in industry and it's not working, there's basically three main possibilities. The controller itself is poorly designed or poorly tuned. That's the focus of what we're talking about. The sensor's not working, so you have a bad measurement coming into the controller. Or finally, the the, you, you, you don't have the ability to actuate correctly. And if you go into a plant um, and you look what the controllers eventually change to achieve the control of temperature or flow or pressure, it's almost always a control valve. Okay. So I say the majority of final control elements are valves. So I'd say 95% of them are valves. Um, and so this, this is a typical valve, okay? It just depicts on how a valve works. And this is, gives you a good idea why it works with pneumatic pressure instead of anything else, okay? So what do we have here? A flow going through here. Let's say it's liquid flow, just for simplicity. So it's going to go through this restriction. Obviously, there's going to be a pressure drop across this valve, which is, you know, well, you have to have pressure drop to control flow, but hopefully, you know, pressure is money, right? If you have pressure and you lose pressure, you have to repressurize. If it's a gas, that means you compress. If it's a liquid, you have to pump, and that costs money, but there's something you have to deal with. How much pressure drop is across this valve is something you'd like to be able to have some control over. We'll talk about that. Okay, so flow goes through this um, opening here. If you want to restrict flow, you take this stem, push it down, put this plug into the opening here, and restrict the flow, okay? And the way the, um, this particular valve is depicted is if you apply the actuating signal, which means air pressure, if you increase the air pressure, it'll push this diaphragm up. You see there's a resistance here to do the spring. It'll lift the, seat, it'll lift the plug out of the, out of the opening, and there'll be more flow. And if you want less flow, you can reduce the pressure, and that will cause the stem to go back down, and then the plug will go into the partially block it, and it'll restrict the flow. Okay, it's, it's a pretty simple concept. On the valve will be a valve position indicator. So if you go back to the valve uh, in the laboratory, you should see something like this on the valve. This is notoriously inaccurate. Okay, um, so like if you looked at this one, you'd say it looks like it's about 60% open, but it it's probably nowhere near 60. That's not a very good indication of the actual position of the valve, but whatever. Okay, so this particular valve depicts if you increase the air pressure to the valve you'll increase the flow, right? Because it'll lift the stem out of the opening and you'll get more flow. You can also actuate on the other side, like increase air pressure, push down instead of push up, either way. Um, it matters because you try to configure these valves so that if, if they are to fail, they're, can, they're the right way. So if this, if this was, um, this would be a, a good design for a flow into a reactor, right? Because if you were to lose this signal, it'll cut off the flow going in, okay? This is a bad design for flow out of a reactor <laughs> because you don't want to cut off the flow if you lose air. You understand any plant has air. They have a lot of compressors that make air, air you know, compressed air, and this compressed air is used all around the plant for a variety of things, including running these valves. If you lose those compressors, which would be a disaster, um, the valves have to be configured the right way, okay? So that's a control valve, not that complex, not too hard to understand, I don't think. Um, even though it's really simple, they often don't work correctly, as we'll talk about. Okay, so this failure mode is what I just talked about. If it, there's two different terminologies, but if something, is, if, you, if the valve is air to open, that means you apply air, it opens up. It's kind of obvious. People also call that fail to close. If you lose the instrument air, it closes. Okay, and then the opposite is air to close. You apply air, valve opens. Wait a minute. <laughs> 
It's always disappointing when you say something and you're like, wait a minute. Totally in contradiction to the text. Air to open. Okay, valve closes when instrument air is lost. Okay. Um, air to close, valve opens when instrument air is lost. So again, it depends on, you know, for inlet flows, you typically want to open, uh, close the valve when you lose air pressure. For outlet flows, you want to empty the unit out so you don't have an explosion or something. So you typically want that to fail open. Okay? All right. So, there's, so this is something you take into the design. When you, pick, when you design a valve, most of you I don't think will ever probably design a valve. But when you pick a valve, let's say you're building a new plant, you have to pick which of these characteristics you want, and it's based on safety, basically. Okay. All right, different valve characteristics. So if we look at these three things, just, just look at the picture for now. This says lift here means the amount of uh, the position of that valve stem. Zero means it's completely closed. One means it's completely open. Okay? This is the flow in some units. doesn't matter. Okay? So there's three basic um, type of valves. One is a linear valve. That's not hard to figure out, right? The flow is proportional to the lift, just with some slope. Okay? Or you could have a valve that looks like this. Obviously, this valve is particularly sensitive at lower positions of the valve, right? Like if you, small change in the, in the lift down here near zero creates a relatively large change in the flow. And on the other hand, you could do something, and that's called a quick opening or square root valve, because that looks like a square root relationship. There's also something called an equal percentage valve, and that tends to be more sensitive when the valve is ma mainly open. Okay? So it's pretty insensitive down here to changes the position of the valve, but highly sensitive over here. Okay, so this is something um, that when you design a valve, you'd have to pick which, which one of these you want. Okay? And typically, um, you try to pick this so that the behavior of the system, including the valve, is as linear as possible. So it's kind of a little bit hard to explain. But um, if the system was linear, you would pick a linear valve. But if it's nonlinear, you might either pick this one or this one because the valve plus the process, if you pick the right valve, might become more linear. That's what this thing. Some more details are given in the text. All right, so this is just something um, you have to choose in the design stage. Or if I were to give you a simple problem, which I'll give you an example of in a minute, I would just tell you which one of these I'm interested in. Okay, so if we wanted to, we could ascribe, just like we did to a sensor, we could describe some kind of dynamics to our valve. Okay, so just so we're on the same page, this is, so this is the tr a transfer function for a valve. That's the input signal to the valve. That's the signal coming from the controller, right? The controller sends a signal to the valve. And the output of the valve is the actual U that goes into the plant. Usually it's a flow. Okay? So signal sent to the valve, flow coming out of the valve. You could describe that in the simplest way possible with a first order transfer function that looks like this. It has some gain and it has some time constant. As I mentioned with the sensors, if this is a decent valve, the time constant of the valve will be a lot less than the time constant of the process. Otherwise, the valve's too slow. Okay? And most valves move pretty quickly. So if your process has time constants of minutes, you'll have no problem having a valve that's faster than that. If you somehow had a, you know, micro, you know, microfluidic device, you know what microfluidics are, like flow on very small scales, then you might find the time constant of the process is actually quite slow and the dynamics of the valve might be kind of limiting. Okay? But for processes of, in manufacturing realms like we focus on in this class, this is usually not going to be a problem. So, We'll typically just describe this with a gain because we'll just assume this thing is much smaller in the process time constant and neglect dynamics of the valve, which is pretty reasonable. Okay, so valves are notorious for not working properly. Um, and these are the kind of things that you can, you can have happen. Okay? So the first thing is called hysteresis. So what this is depicting is, um, I guess I got these out of the book. I'm not sure they call them U and Y, but anyway, this, you could think of this as being position of the valve, you know, the lift, and this is the flow out of the valve. Okay. What this says is if you increase, you know, you're opening up the valve, you get a different flow than when you're closing the valve. This is, you know, you've heard the term hysteresis before. If the valve was working properly, it would just go like this, right? It would follow the same tr track going down as going up. But in this case, you can get valve hysteresis, so you go up, you get these flows, you come back, you get a totally different set of flows. <laughs> okay. This is an undesirable behavior okay, for, for the valve. Another one which is pretty common is this kind of dead band or sticking behavior. So you 
this is this is not very dramatically drawn, but so you're opening up the valve and there's no change in flow, no change in flow, and then eventually the flow starts changing. It usually doesn't look like that actually. It looks more like this. So here's the flow, here's the position of the valve. So you get something where you're opening, nothing happens, you know, you're, it's sticking. And then eventually you apply enough pressure, it pops up and then starts increasing. Because it just sticks until you apply enough pressure to overcome the sticking of the valve, okay? So this is a, this is a bit of a problem, right? Especially if you want to operate in a, in a flow in that range, can't even get it. So these kind of problems are extremely common, okay? I mentioned there's something called a valve positioner. You can put that on the valve to try to overcome some of these problems. But what you find is if you are a process engineer or a control engineer, you will see all kinds of problems with these valves. And the operators are constantly going out and trying to maintain and fix the valves, OK? Because like I said, it, your ability to operate the plant in an automated fashion depends intimately on these valves. If these valves aren't working, you can't even operate the plant. So it's very common that um, people identify problems. I mean, you can see. Most modern control systems, you can monitor the position of the valve in addition to the flow coming out of the valve. And if you start to see your valve exhibit this behavior, it means someone's got to go out and work on it, not you, luckily. Right? Someone from the op some operator has to go out to in the, into the field, try to fix this valve. So it's very common these valves aren't working properly, just the way it is. Okay? And because you have so many of them, and a typical plant's hundreds, it's very common that at any given time, there's a subset of them that aren't working. OK, so this is a very simple um, slide on how to size a control valve. OK, so this is just a design equation. So you have a flow. And then, so what, what are you trying to do when you size a control valve? You're trying to figure out what type, size, and type of valve do you need to establish a certain flow. So we're going to use this equation to do that. So this design equation says the flow is equal to this over here. Let's start at the end. So this is the pressure drop across the valve. OK. And then divided by, since we're, I guess, using um, ridiculous English units, the specific gravity of the fluid. And then this is the so-called valve characteristic. This was that plot I showed you of how the flow out of the valve changes the function of position of the valve. It's a linear valve. That's a linear relationship. Otherwise, it's square root and so on. Okay? And then you have something called the valve coefficient. Okay? So the typical game here is that you specify what you'd like the pressure drop across the valve to be. Okay? What, what type of valve you would like, what flow you would like to establish, and then you size the valve with this valve coefficient. And then you go to some manufacturer and buy it. Okay? And they're, I think I mentioned they're not cheap. Even the ones in the lab are probably about $1,000 a piece. And if you had a big valve that was controlling flow in a pipeline, I mean like a valve this big, it might be $100,000 for a valve or something. A little extreme. But you could expect that in industry, buying a valve would be several thousand dollars. So you'd like to size it properly, OK? So and these are the, the so-called valve characteristics. So if you have a linear valve, you have this. So I'm talking about this function here that has that relationship. If it's quick opening or square root, it looks like this. And if it's so-called equal percentage, it looks like this um, with, so that's the lift, the amount open, and r is some parameter. In the plot I showed you, I think r was 40, OK? Typically, unless you had a reason to do otherwise, you would always pick a linear valve. If you had reason to believe you needed one of these, you could choose it. But typically, you would, you would choose linear. All right, so here's a little toy problem from the book. So we have this problem here. Pump, so pumping create pressure here, 40 PSI. Um, we have a pressure drop across this heat exchanger of 30 PSI. Here's the flow rate of fluid through this. And then we have a control valve. And we want a pressure drop across this control valve of 10 PSI at the same flow. So obviously, if it starts at 40 and you lose 30 here and you lose 10 there, pressure coming out is 0. So the inlet pressure is um, 10. The outlet pressure is 0. And then the idea here, is this the question you're asked? Design a linear control valve. By design, it means give me the, val the, the valve coefficient CV. I want this valve to be 50% open at the nominal flow rate for a fluid that looks like water. Right? That's a specific gravity of water. OK, because in order to use this design equation that I just showed you, you have to, you have to specify an L value. So it's, a tip, it's pretty reasonable, right? At the flow rate you think you're going to normally operate, have the valve half open. Does that make sense to you? That way you can increase 50% and decrease 50%. Um, 
I should mention that it's very common, well, I'll do this at the end. Let's just finish this example here. Okay, so this is the problem you have, okay? And you have <coughs> a pressure drop across the valve, you can see here, of 10 PSI. So rather than go on the previous slide, because I know you guys hate that, I, I've, ta I've taken, I don't think that's okay, t I t took this equation and um, solved it for CV. Okay, it was the equation on the previous slide. I solved it for CV in terms of everything else. Remember, the other equation was Q equals CV times all this stuff. So I just solved this for CV, and now I just plug in everything I know. That's the flow rate of interest, 200. I told you that this is a linear valve. That means F equals L, and I told you L is going to be um, 0.5, means 50% open. The pressure drop is 10. Specific gravity of the fluid is 1. Compute this thing. Valve coefficient is 127. So if you were to purchase this valve, you would tell a manufacturer, I want a linear valve. They may not have the CV exactly of 127. You, know, they, you might settle for a CV of 100 or something like that. They don't make every possible CV unless you want to get it specially made. Then you'd also have to say something about the material of construction. Like I want it to be stainless steel, something like that. Okay. Now if you don't, sol if you don't um, size these valves correctly, so here's what you're kind of looking for. So here is time, let's say. And let's say here's the position of the valve, which we call L. And let's say this thing is 50% or 0.5. Okay. You'd like the valve to kind of, you know, it's going to move. Obviously, it's going to move around because it's controlling a flow. But you want it to be, you know, in the kind of middle of the range of the valve. Okay. If the valve's not properly sized, Okay, the valve, let's say, is sized far too big. The valve's way too big. And this is the 50%. You'll find the f it's always down here. Okay, that means the valve is, is way too big because it barely has to open in order to get the flow that you need. And in fact, sometimes might often just be totally closed. This is a bad design because all this rangeability of the valve is not even used. Right? You're always operating the valve 0 to 10% or 0 to 20% means it's oversized. If it's undersized, it'll always be way up here. Okay. And if you undersize a valve or oversize a valve, it won't control the flow nearly as well if it's sized correctly. Okay. So actually sizing the valve is important. Um, if you know anything about how companies work, it's possible that you could get a valve that's not sized properly because they already had the valve. Do you understand how this works? So one time I worked for ExxonMobil and I asked them, well, they, they're complaining about one of their distillation columns. They're like, it's too small. I forget what the complaint was. To do the separation, I'm like, well, why, did, why was it designed that way? Go, oh, it wasn't designed. It was already here, right? Like, why get a new column if you can use a column that's already here and just move it over? <laughs> so, so some of this instrumentation uh, may be poorly designed because it was already at the plant or someone just didn't do a good job of sizing it or the plant changed a lot over time. Throughputs are much higher. Now the valve is too small, something like that. All right. Oh, well, that's exciting. All right, on to the next lecture. Questions? Yeah. Uh, so, just to be clear, you know, I'm going to miss this. The L value and the F of L value, that's always going to be between 0 and 1, right? Right. I mean, for this equation, it's between 0 and 1. You might talk about, I always, see, I always talk about percentage verbally, which is like 50% open, but that means 0.5, right? So 1 means fully open, 0 means fully closed. That's for both the, the lift and the valve. Well, depending on the equation, right? So the lift goes between 0 and 1. The flow is whatever the equation here says it can go between. Right, this is, yeah, I'm sorry. This is not the flow, this is the valve characteristic. So in this case, right, this goes between 0 and 1. This would go between 0 and 1. Let me see, would this one go between 0 and 1? So if L is 1, you get 0, and that's 1. And if L is 0, you get something to the minus 1. I'm not sure about that one. These definitely, go, F here definitely goes between 0 and 1, and here 0 to 1. And here has an upper limit of 1, clearly. But it's not clear it has a lower limit of 0. <coughs> In fact, it wouldn't seem to. Should though. Yeah. Yeah. What's a big R? In that R is this is just a per, uh, something you pick as a function of the, of the valve. So if we go back and look at this plot, you see that they gave you a plot of this equal percentage valve for particular R of equal to forty. Okay. 
I don't know what to call R. <laughs> the equal percentage number R. Some, I would just give that to you. There's no way for you to know that, right? And there's not really a good way, given what I've told you. Anytime I say something like see the text, it means I'm thinking the detailed discussion of this is out of the scope of what we want. So if I wanted to do anything with a valve, I'd tell you what type of valve to use. I wouldn't ask you to figure out which, which type is best. Okay, any other questions? All right. So, like I said, um, when you go into la the lab and you have a, some of, the, some of the experiments aren't instrumented at all, like trying to think, ion exchange. There's no instrument, right? It's all manual. But if you go to, what, there's a reactor there? What, 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 there's a catalytic reactor, I think, right, in the lab. There's a pH unit. There's a heat exchanger unit. There's a col distillation column. All these things have a lot of instrumentation. So, and if you're running the distillation column, you've got a lot of free time, right? So you should go, go, just go look and see what the instrumentation looks like. It's sitting around. You'll see, you'll see obviously, uh, pipes that have valves on them. You'll see, you should see lines coming out with thermocouples because there'll have to be wires coming out of those. You'll see, um, you'll see flow meters, yeah. So you should just look at the instrumentation and get a better feeling for what it actually looks like. Obviously, the scale is very small um, in the lab, but it's, it's similar to what you'd see in industry. Okay, so now we want, so what have we done so far in control? Well, we've talked about, we've tried to motivate why we need control. We've talked about the PID controller and kind of conceptually what it looks like to hook up a controller to a process. And um, we've talked now about instrumentation in order, you know, you can't do control without being able to measure and actuate. And so now we're starting to talk about some concepts. This is more high level, I would say. Um, and soon after the exam, we'll get into the kind of more detailed, right, very mathematical stuff about how to design controllers. But for now, I, so the goal of the course, I think, in terms of control is twofold. One is so that you can know the theory of how to do control, right? It's kind of like fluid, when you take fluid dynamics, you shouldn't be satisfied with, you know, when fluid goes down a pipe, it, 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 there's a frictional effect on the wall and it loses pressure, right? Okay. I mean, that shouldn't be the sum total of your knowledge of, of how fluids flow through pipes and things like this. So, um, but you, you know, you don't want to get lost in the math so you don't understand the basic idea of what's being done. So the lectures tend to be a combination of ones like this that are maybe a little higher level and then ones that are a little low, I don't know if lower level is the right term, but a little more mathematically inclined, okay? So here, I'm just trying to introduce the idea of, let's say you have a process, a unit, and you want to design a control system for this. How do you even go about start thinking how to do the design? Okay. Obviously, for most of the problems I give you, but not all, I tend to tell you, um, oh, here's the input, here's the output, design a controller. But if you're actually doing a real control problem, or I want a little more out of you on the question, you, I could ask you, what's an appropriate input to, to manipulate? What's an appropriate output to control? Okay. So it depends on what you're trying to achieve in the particular system. So what I want to do here is talk a little bit about how we go about doing this. I'll start by talking about design. There really should be more integration in um, our courses in terms of talking about design and control in a more unified way, but at least in some of the lectures I try to point out what happens if you have design errors or problems. You remember I did that with like piping, if you get a big time delay because someone connects a pipe up here. It's not, that's not a control problem, that's a design problem. If you want to fix it, someone's got to rerun the pipe. I'll talk real quickly about something called control degrees of freedom, and most of it's actually on this. How do we go about selecting things to measure and to actuate and to control? And I'll talk a little bit about the end about um, safety. Do you guys get safety in any class? Do you get it like in reaction engineering and all? No? Okay. One lecture? All right. Because that's a big push, whoa, big push now from, a, you know, ABET. They're the accreditation things, is that they're trying to get people to have more safety. So my, my perception is that we don't talk much about safety in the curriculum and probably should do better. But anyway, all right. So here's what we're trying to, um, to achieve it with control is that obviously first th uh, goal is to be safe. Actually, it's not the first goal. I knew a guy, DuPont, because that's what du I used to work at DuPont for a little while, and they're like, safety is the first like, first priority, and the, guy, the guy's like, 
he was a DuPont fellow, so he's not too stupid. He's like, if safety was the first priority, we wouldn't make any chemicals at all. Because <laughs> it's inherently not safe to like mix chemicals together at high temperature and pressure. Okay, but anyway, so it is important to obviously operate safely and um, I think we saw in that video, and this happens maybe every six months, there'll be some major plant explosion or something and it, it, it looks very bad for our whole industry and all the people that work in it. Um, there's environmental regulations one has to satisfy in terms of emissions from a plant. A uh, plant has to be stable, means, I don't mean stable like not exploding, I mean that it has to, it has to operate smoothly um, about a steady state so people have confidence in how the plant's being run. You have to satisfy specifications on the pro uh, pr quality of the products and also the amount produced, the production rate, and you, you have to make money. That's, that's, you could argue, put that to number one, right? Um, you have to make money in order for this all to make sense, okay? And these other things you could argue are all about making money, right? Because if you don't do this, you don't have a plant. If you don't do this, they shut your plant down. If you don't do, you know. So it's no question that it's, it's, a, it's an economic game. Okay. So with control system design, you know, in a nutshell, here's what we try to do. So let's say you're at a plant and you're on a unit, a distillation column, and there's no existing control system. Okay, and they ask you to come in and design the control system for this. First thing you have to do, which is implied here, is you have to figure out what you're trying to achieve with control. Like this is a column where the, all that matters is the overhead composition because the, the bottom stuff is just like burned or something. It's, it has no value. Okay? So you have to figure out what you're trying to do with control. Then you have to select the variables. What are you going to control? What are you going to manipulate? And what are you going to measure? Okay? Usually the controlled, controlled variables are a subset of the things that you measure. You specify the control structure and type, meaning you have to decide how this overall control system is going to be structured. I'll, I'll, um, that sounds like a, a Webster dictionary um, definition there. But um, you specify how you're going to put the control system together. Typically, these controllers, you have more than one input you're going to control and more than one thing you're going to manipulate in a real plant. Okay? So you have to decide how you're going to manage those different control controllers and then what type of controllers you're going to use. At this point, you only know one type, PID, but there's other types we'll talk about. And then eventually you have to tune the controllers, you have to commission the control system, turn it on, um, and make sure it works properly. So really what, we, what I'm trying to focus on in this lecture is how do we go about doing this part right here. All right. So there's two types of, um, so we're talking about a real control problem, meaning one that you're going to encounter outside this class. Um, there's going to be more than one input and output. Like there's not many units that you're going to be interested in controlling that have one input and one output. They'll probably the only one is like a storage tank, right? Then the only thing you probably want to control is the level in that tank by, controlling, by manipulating the flow out of that tank. But everything else has many inputs and outputs. So this requires what we call multivariable control. You have to find a way to use these inputs that are available to you to control these outputs. Um, the first strategy is what we focus on in the class. Okay, and so this is, this is just to let you know where we're headed. Um, the second is, we, I may mention near the end of the course, but it's, we don't have really time to cover this in a substantial way. This is a divide and conquer strategy. Okay. So if I told you, here's how you go about designing a controller if you have one input and one output. Okay. And then I tell you you have two inputs and two outputs. The first thing you should think of is, well, if I can pair one of those inputs with one of the outputs and the other input with the other output, then I can just do the same thing I know how to do twice, right? Just design two controllers in the same way I'm taught.